a time, my night and my day That your heart will sorely be grieving For the stranger's land may be bright and fair And rich in his treasures older But you'll pine, I know, for the long ago And the love that is never older And there's plenty of wealth in Wayland For gems at dawn, the rich and the grand Their faces with hunger paling For the road is weary and hard to tread And the lights of the cities will blind you Won't you turn our store to wear and shore And the one that you're leaving behind you And the meadow is falling I'll turn the store from the throng And listen, maybe you'll hear me calling For the sound of a voice and a surely miss For somebody's quick returning Oh, Arun, Arun, would you come back soon To the one who will always love you You'll be leaving It's many a time My night and my day That your heart will sorely be grieving For the stranger's land May be bright and fair And rich in its treasures golden But you'll pine I know For the long ago In the love that has never to the one, the only, mystifying oracle of radio, your Ghost Man and Demon Hunter show. Hello, Demon Hunter. It's my Ghost Man and Demon Hunter show. That's right. It, uh, <laughs> it is, and I take full credit for it, and it's all it. the proceeds go to me. Proceeds yeah. go to you. Well, they're not going to us. Fortunately, we've Bro. over the past, what, <laughs> seven years, we've made about $36 and spent about 2000 to keep the show up and running. So there well, are no proceeds. 36 and some change. <laughs> <laughs> oh, man. It is Sunday night. Like I was saying, guys, welcome back. It, we missed you. We missed you. It's been a long week, man. It's been a long week. And uh, uh, again, uh, week. last week, I, uh, I couldn't make the show and we, we rebooked everything. And thank mm-hmm. you. Ghost man for uh, understanding. I the, I had the death of a friend and I had to yes. uh, attend the funeral. So I appreciate everyone's patience with my our coming back this week. Well, sometimes it you know that kind of stuff happens. We're sorry to hear about that. It does happen. It's never a good thing in the family or friends. Yeah, but, now uh, that I brought the whole show down. For yeah, the night, good uh, note yeah. to go off on. Hey, uh, Demon Hunter, what do you think about that band tonight? Huh? 
I think you picked a band that didn't have screeching guitars just for me. <laughs> it was hard, but it was uh, the Irish coming out. And uh, guys, you can find out more about that band. Their name is Burning Bridget Cleary. Find out more about them at burningbridgetcleary.com. And you can check them out on Facebook. Just look for dot com. Just look for the uh, Burning Bridget Cleary. But I love them, man. Great band. Uh, beautiful, beautiful ladies' voices there. And uh, wow. I love them. We'll be playing some more during the break, too. John loves the lady voices. I love the lady voices. I figured you'd love it because you love all that Renaissance fair and <laughs> stuff like that. But they, they were really not. Uh, yeah, I go to the Irish Fest. Call me a geek, man. I go to the Irish Fest here. Huh? You call me a geek? No, no, not at all. Uh, yeah. But the, uh, you know, I go to the uh, Irish Fest every year. I get into that stuff. I like it. You wear a kilt? No, I do. You know, I have seen some guys wear kilts. I just can't get into that. You know? <laughs> They they wear these uh, they wear these furry muffins. Uh, I don't know if it hangs from their underwear underneath. I don't even know. Do they wear underwear underneath those things? You would know. Uh, you should. The proper wearing of a kilt does not involve underwear. No. Really? Yes. Well, what happened if you got hit? Yeah. What happened? <laughs> what happened if you got hit in battle and your junk flew out? Or well, whatever. It's. Uh, I want a biggie fry. It depends on where you're from. I mean, you're <laughs> Irish, so, you know, chances are nobody would see anything. Oh, oh that's a pee-pee joke. That's uh, good. Uh, that's good, uh, guys. Uh. Yeah, but tonight's band, Bernie Bridget Cleary, loving them to death. And Demon Hunter wants to talk about a very serious matter that, uh, very serious, a uh, very good cause that we're backing nowadays, right? Indeed, indeed. And we're going to hit this right off the bat so we don't forget, right? <laughs> yeah, absolutely right. Absolutely right. Um, guys, we are, you might notice if you went to our website, ghostanddemon.com. If you haven't been there, shame on you. Go there uh, as soon as the show's over. Well, you're there right now. Listen. But uh, we're supporting, guys, proudly supporting the three-day Race for the Cure, Susan G. Komen. Um, we have uh, some friends, Sandy Merritt and Elizabeth Knoll, that's running, guys. What a great cause. What a just cause. So uh, just go to our site, ghostanddemon.com. We have uh, Demon Hunters put the link up there. You just got to click on it, then click on donate, guys. It's a great cause. Join the fight today. It's a very real, very serious thing, and we can't beat this, Demon Hunter. We can. And uh, from what I understand, the three-day is actually sponsored and... Uh you know, participated in by people who have either family who are involved with uh, currently dealing with breast cancer or have lost the battle to, for breast cancer. In this case, uh, with the people we're helping sponsor, they're, they're going out in memory of those they've lost to breast cancer. And it's, it. uh, it's uh, like Sean said, big deal, big, uh, big problem and uh, a big chance for you to help out. Uh, go to the website, www.ghostanddemon.com. Scroll down to where it says, we support the Susan G. Komen three-day. Yes. And, uh, click there, and you can go right to the uh, Susan, uh, Sandy and Elizabeth's site and uh, make a donation, support them. And uh, they, and I, I was watching, Sean. They're going to walk for three days. They are, for three That's long days. Yep. So it's uh, and don't make us look stupid, guys. Somebody go in there and donate for Christ's somebody, sake. Somebody donate some money. We're so. going on eight years of bringing you the biggest stars in the paranormal and around the world, and you know both television and silver screen. And uh, this is silver all we've <laughs> this is all we've asked you for, people. <laughs> go help these ladies. Oh, please. Somebody somebody show the love. I was thinking, Sean, maybe we should start. We have a Ghost Man and Demon Hunter page. Yeah. Mm -hmm. uh, you know, I was talking to my wife, Chrissy P. Yeah. And she was saying Why would that, you do that? Uh, maybe what we need is a group where people wife. can get involved on Facebook with the Ghost Man and Demon Hunter. And, uh, yeah. and, you know, I've got the only wife that wants me getting involved with people. Right. But uh, she, See? they could get involved and, and get involved with the conversation uh, with us more and... Uh, Maybe that's what we need to do, because, folks, we, I, I checked our, our ratings. We've got thousands of listeners thousands all over the world. around the world. And, uh, you know, tens of thousands of hits and downloads all each over. month. Yeah. To, you know, we just don't, you know, some of you, we hear from you. 
but some of you we don't. So please go to our Facebook page, like us on Facebook, yeah. go to our web page. You can find everywhere we are out there. You can find us from there at ghostanddemon.com. And uh, let us know you're listening because uh, we enjoy bringing you the show every week. But sometimes we feel like, you know, until we got the uh, ratings last week and saw how many people are actually listening, <laughs> Sean and I are like, well, we probably have three listeners out mm. there somewhere. It's, uh, yeah. <laughs> Yeah, well, we don't do it for the listeners. We do it for the... Well, we do, because we love you guys. We, well, that's a good way to get them to come and listen to talk. <laughs> we don't do it for you We people. don't do it. It's all for us. We it's don't for need us, no, people. No stinking listeners. No, um, yeah, man, we got the report back on... Uh, uh, special thanks to Terry, too. Uh, got, got some inside scoop on where we're at, and uh, it's good, man. It's, it's good to see the art that you produce is liked by the masses, so... But, but how... How can we thank you if you don't let us know we're out there? Help us thank you. Help us. us to, oh, thank you. That was good. Yeah, I try. Anyway, guys, Sandy Merritt, <laughs> Elizabeth Knoll, Sweethearts, and uh, Cancer Fighters, guys. So uh, hats off to them and the G&D Nation, the Shadow Nation. We expect you to run in behind them and uh, back your people, man. We just a good fight. Let's do it. And moving on. Dun, dun, dun. Dun, dun, dun. Demon Hunter. Hey, I wanted to mention, we are now on Stitcher, and we've always been on Planet Paranormal, but now, guys, you can find us on Stitcher. That's Stitcher, S-T-I-T-C-H-E-R, dot com. Special thanks to those folks for putting us up so fast. Yeah, really, I was amazed. We sent them the email, they sent it right back, said, yeah, send us your stuff. We want you on uh, Stitcher. So, mm -hmm. there we are, where now you can find us at Planet Paranormal, iTunes, and Stitcher, plus uh, a few dozen other places that, uh, I guess, we're starting to post on but those you can find those right on our page again too that's it demon hunter ghost man shadow nation dun 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 tonight's guest dun 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 from the amc's hit series the walking dead actor scott wilson stops by tonight Woo! Yeah. Yes, I'm not kidding, guys. Scott Wilson, Herschel Green, stops by. We're going to talk about his neck wound. <laughs> no, I'm kidding. That's uh, right, folks. This is a spoiler <laughs> alert for this show. <laughs> spoiler alert. Yeah. We'll be talking about The Walking Dead, so if you haven't watched, uh, you know, get ready. <laughs> actor Scott Wilson, guys. What a great actor. Been going since 1960 from such great films as The Great Gatsby, Exorcist 3 in cold blood and of course most recently known for his work on the amc classic the walking dead tonight on your gnd show you like that <laughs> he's yeah. gonna be like why do you have to talk about the neck wound bro yo yo man, why you gotta do that <laughs> herschel oh, can you believe herschel green's gonna be sitting here he's gonna be here tonight He's gonna be here, and I'm nervous. I know. And I'm, we uh, can't. <laughs> we had the Rook man on. We had Mikey we, Rooker. We didn't, we didn't have time to get nervous with yeah. Rooker. We called this. We called his house. His phone picked up. and went Rooker. And yeah. Like, okay. And he was. Hi. <laughs> he was Merle on the show with the uh, blade on his head. Now a lot of you guys don't know how the stuff is when the guest isn't in studio, and we called him in after you know a month of planning <laughs> for you people and talking to agents and talent agents and and this and publishers. We finally get the uh, the the, uh, the talent, the actor. We get him booked. Uh, and we have a very small time frame. You have, you know, and sometimes the actor or whatever, they'll go longer and sometimes they're formatted. We've had a, hey, we've been lucky, Demon Hunter. We've had some cool ones on the show. Yes, we have. Yeah, we have. And like Rooker, man, where else could these folks, we called Michael Rooker, a.k.a. Merle from The Walking Dead. We called him while he was doing, what was he doing? Kata. Kata in the back. <laughs> he was like, oh, I forgot about this. Are we live? <laughs> that was great. That was terrific. Anyway, yeah. how's your week going, man? What's been going it on? Make you feel important, like uh, being forgotten. <laughs> yeah, it does. Yeah, it happens to us a lot. But we get them for you guys week after week after week. We bring them on because we love you. So what happened this week, Demon Hunter? Anything going on in the life and times of Demon Hunter? No. Oh, well, that makes for a good uh, segue <laughs> into the news. <laughs> way, way, way to keep things going there, yeah, Nate. Yeah, huh? you're keeping uh, it hot and fluffy. Not really. Um, I, like I said, I, I lost a dear friend last week yes. and, uh, who was a brother Mason, so we went and we did the whole Masonic ceremony at his funeral. Yeah. And uh, that took up the whole day, like you can imagine. And 
then the week just kind of flew by. It, the next thing you knew, here we were. And honestly, I was up last night. I couldn't sleep. I was thinking about what we were going to talk about tonight on the show. Yeah, so. a lot of questions and stuff uh, for the man. We're celebs now, I guess, because we've hobnobbed with these folks for going on eight years now. You know? We're celebrities by association. I heard one woman say, and to think, I knew you when you were... <laughs> and I'm like, hey, I just interviewed these people, man. <laughs> you know? Yeah, it's uh, it, it's kind of funny when you get uh, into that situation where people are like, I remember when you... Well, I'm still sitting in a studio talking to people. You yes. Know? So, but it's a, it's a fun way to uh, not make a living. You yeah, know, but the uh, <laughs> the uh, logo for the Ghost and Demon, Ghost Man and Demon are show for tw- 2014. This is going to be one of those nights. I can't even pronounce 2014. The the new saying, the the uh, the word of the day, the word oh, of the, the slogan, show. the slogan. Yeah, yes. there you go. I see. I need help. Not Appar- the logo. I'm like, are we changing our photo? What is apparently this about? new tablet? Any new data? It's going to be. Are you watching closely? On a radio show, Sean, our uh, our slogan is going to be, are you watching closely? Yeah, well, they're watching right now. Well, the people that tune in, they can watch the show. Well, that's right, true. Big things coming. Big things coming. That's all we can say. I got the I got the good vibe. Huh? You don't think that uh, the slogan should be, Ghost Man and Demon Hollander, still bringing home the crazy? <laughs> well, that's true. We could do that. We could do that. Hey, anyway, uh, guys, apologize for the week before last. Uh, the big blizzard hit Indianapolis, and... Uh, Hey, man, we made it through, though. The show busted down twice during the show. And then finally... A while tree we, fell on the studio. Yeah, and then we're talking to our good friend Patrick uh, Doyle from uh, Ghost Mine on Sci-Fi Channel after the show. And all of a sudden, <laughs> everything goes bzz, right? We had just finished up, and I hung up with you guys, and uh, all the lights out. So, we were done. But uh, we made it to safety, all the stuff. I think last Wednesday, they got our power back on. So I'm sitting in the house. It's 30 degrees. I'm staring at my flat screen television going, huh, wonder when I should start moving the <laughs> moving the electronics out of the house because there was ice forming on the inside of the window. But I went and I got a bunch of wood and I started a fire in the house and uh, we cranked up everything. Kept it above 54 degrees and it barely. Yeah, I think it got it to like 43. It was at 38, 37. I think got it up to about 43. So I'm sitting there watching my breath and the uh, power comes back on. So I've I've been in a I've been around you on a warm day and been able to watch your breath. Oh. Ah. Mm-hmm. Okay. Without further delay, Demon Hunter and listeners around the world. G and D show in the news. Uh, it's always fresh. It's always exciting. It's a little goofy, and it starts right now. Nice. That's right, ladies and gentlemen. This is when Sean and I pick our favorite news stories by the titles in the news columns. Uh, we don't read the stories beforehand, so we're liable to make a lot of mistakes. This is where the G&D drinking game comes in. If Sean and I make a mistake while reading the news, you take a drink. Of course, we recommend that if you are listening to this show on a podcast while driving your car, don't play the G&D drinking game. Yeah. And if you're sitting around and planning to drive later, listen responsibly. Listen to it. Yeah. In the news, guys, first one from the Huffington Post Weird News. It's from January 19th, 2014. That'd be today, David Hunt. That would be. Yeah. Sasquatch's favorite foods revealed by Fighting Bigfoot star Bobo Fay. Is that a real name? I, I'm just trying to figure out if uh, he's a bounty hunter or a Bigfoot hunter. <laughs> Is it Bobo Fay? Yeah, I don't know. Anyway, Sasquatches. Can you that, say Sasquatches? That, is that like Boba Fett's like cross-dressing brother? Yeah. Boba Fett. Yeah. Know. He didn't like violence. <laughs> that's the <laughs> brother that's scared of violence. <laughs> oh. Yeah. So, Bobo Fett. Anyway, I want to find the forget Sasquatch. I want to find the guy named I'm Bobo Fett. Get Faye. hate mail now from <laughs> from Bobo Fett. <Faye. laughs> uh, yeah, you probably will. We could be uh, we could be in trouble from Bobo Fett's attorney. So. I think we've said his name enough times that we can actually. <laughs> okay, guys, this is what Bobo Face says about Sasquatch. The way to Bigfoot's heart may be through its stomach, according to one of the stars of the Animal Planet series, Finding Bigfoot. Cast member James Bobo Fay has been searching for Sasquatch since the early 1980s. That's nice. I think we said his name. He hasn't trapped the hairy creature, but believes certain food items might provide the recipe for success. The key 
sweets, and meats, especially bacon. Since the early 1900s, God, you can get anybody bacon, man. Yeah. You can get me. I'll in case. step at the trap for bacon. Right. I'll take a foot off for a piece of bacon. Maybe not a piece, but like a BLT with mayo, no oh. tomato, white bread, toasted lightly. Oh, anyway, since the early 1900s, there's been reports from people saying, I was cooking bacon, and the big feet came in and licked the pan clean when I set it down later. He said in a video produced in advance of the show, uh, of the show's November 10th season premiere, the creature usually settle a raw, settle on a raw meat like deer or fruits and berries, but definitely have a craving for a good home cooked meal. Who doesn't? They love, yeah, they love cooked food. He said, adding that researchers have success attracting the creatures when cooking out in the wild. It puts the smell in the air, demon hunter. Bacon is the big. Bacon is big with Bigfoots, as well as the chicken wings. Who doesn't like chicken wings? Well, yeah. I mean, it is football season. Right. <laughs> Bigfoot's probably trying to put together a spread for uh, to get around to sit around the tube yeah. and watch the uh, Super Bowl. Guys, got to do that. On a hunt with Huffington Post Weird News editor Andy Campbell, the Finding Bigfoot team laid out a giant serving tray full of hot wings. They didn't work, but blueberries and apples do apparently. They like the fact that deer are attracted to apples. He said. Faye has been known to put out donuts when on a hunt. This guy's off the off the reservation, man. He's been putting out donuts on a hunt and says he is known for his key insight on the big fit cuisine. Huh? How many drinks have people taken so far? I don't know. <laughs> Any scientific expert will tell you me and the Sasquatch like the same things. Well, four out of five <laughs> scientists say. Huh? Isn't that convenient though? Him and yeah. Bigfoot like the same stuff. Maybe they're related. Well, I mean, you just, you never can't tell, Nathan. So, in the news, thank you, Huffington Post. That was in the, the news. Uh, actually, Sean, uh, Huffington Post has another story that argues that. Hmm. Because apparently, yeah, there is a report. Okay. That big that a man claims that Bigfoot has been eating his pizza. Really? Really? Did he pay for it or? <laughs> big. No, that's the problem. It, it's a run-of-the-mill case. A man claims an assailant vandalized his estate, his estate uh. requests assistance from the law enforcement. The only, uh, <laughs> uh, yeah. the only issue is the accused, in this instance, is a Bigfoot, who allegedly has been wandering around the Michigan property for more than a decade, shape-shifting and eating pizza. Maybe you've seen those uh, billboards that are hanging everywhere. What's it say? Michigan.org? Maybe, you know, it's, uh, on Saturday, a 52-year-old uh, Breckenridge, Me uh, Michigan uh -huh. man came uh, to Middletown, uh, ah, have a drink, folks, Midland Law Enforcement Center, uh, uh, armed with evidence, including a photo album, empty food containers, dirt, and alleged Bigfoot scat. <laughs> <laughs> scat, be bop, 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 bop. <laughs> and asked for help verifying <laughs> the existence of the mystical creature, Ooh. according to the report uh, from Midland County's Sheriff's Office. Scatty Buddha, bop, bop. The man, Anthony Padel, la, Padella, there we go. Drink up, folks. No, that one, that one was just a uh, pronunciation. <laughs> <laughs> Spoke to the Sheriff's Department, <laughs> explaining that he accidentally awoke the Bigfoot spirit by knocking branches against the trees to break them into smaller pieces. Bigfoot spirit? This Yes, uh, with the story, now the uh, whole story comes out, huh, Sean? Wow. This began when he moved into the 17-acre property in 1997, according to the uh, incident report, which was sent to the Huffington Post. I can't imagine the police got this and didn't send it to the Huffington Post <laughs> right away. Uh, Padella had uh, a serious sighting, a series of sightings years ago, when he thought he saw a man in a gorilla suit hunting. Right. Oh, I'm sorry, ghillie suit. Uh, you can drink for that one, folks. Drink a ghillie suit hunting. Heavily. When, uh, but when the they looked at the eyes, yeah. the being began to fade into the mist. Oh. The mist then reformed into a white-tailed deer and ran away <laughs> into the woods. The reporter states. Uh... <laughs> Though the existence of the hairy beast known as Bigfoot, Yeti, Sasquatch, has never been proven, many have tried. For years, Padella has seen 
what he believes is evidence of Bigfoot. Yeah. Including his scat. <laughs> I just that's fun to say. <laughs> she likes Dead it. Animals. <laughs> Tree branch, uh, trees broken uh, <laughs> in specific ways. Yeah, because, you know, those trees don't break on their own. Uh, uh, I thought you said he was eating tree branches. Ow. Ow. Impressions of snow Ugh. and uh, and foot boxes. I, I, that's not wrong, folk. I'm, I'm reading that right. <laughs> boxes rolled into shapes and forged into triangles. Scat- forged into triangles. <laughs> Scattered be bop bop pet. <laughs> Apparently, Bigfoot likes triangles, okay? Do these get? This story's starting to go a bit long. But, uh, <laughs> no, keep going, really. Everybody's into it. Oh, good. Cool. <laughs> In the incident report, Deputy Thomas Anderson said Padella asked that the food boxes be s- <laughs> and scat be tested for DNA. Yeah. Oh, he was good, cool. kindly told that DNA uh, processes, is, processes is only used for serious crimes and that Bigfoot is not suspected of any criminal activity. Right. Anderson wrote. I explained <coughs> the scat would not contain DNA. Beep, bop, bop. And he was reminded that the MSP, Michigan State Police, right. won't process it. Okay. They don't want the poop, Sean. <laughs> uh, Padella said that he wanted the sheriff's office to verify his claims to help him win a ten million dollar cash prize. Did he get the ten million dollars? Um, apparently, the uh, competitors on the ten million dollar Bigfoot uh, bounty, a new reality television show, are being offered that uh, amount of money. But uh, he didn't realize that he couldn't just find the evidence and turn it in. So, right. but there we go, Sean. Uh, Bigfoot likes pizza. Oh, nice. I like pizza. Hoo-ah! Yes. Well, I've seen your feet. Well, was it them? No. Was it? It wasn't my feet. Hey, this must be a big di- uh big night, <laughs> a bigfoot night. I'm ready for sex. Yes, because I got another story, Demon Hunter. Not you, no. Yeah. Comes from our good friends at the Huffington Post. Okay. Yeah. Weird news, guys. Man, they feed us a lot. We love these guys. They are cool. Yeah. We like them. Bigfoot Hunter. Here we go again, Demon Hunter. Here we go, Shadow Nation. Bigfoot Hunter Rick Dyer claims he killed the hairy beast. And we'll take it on tour. Oh, jeez. Yeah, this is from January 5th. I did see this on the news feed off of uh, CNN again. And uh, I, I, let's read Did he this buy story. it in a refrigerator box full of ice? <laughs> hey, we've had those people on the show. <laughs> <laughs> okay, here we go. Hunter Rick Dyer, Demon Hunter, says he shot and killed a Bigfoot and is now preparing to take its body on a tour of America. It's kind of a step up from the boy who cried wolf in this case. It's a man who cried Bigfoot. There's one big, yeah, there's one big difference between this story and the many others where people claim to have seen the dubious tall, I said that right, dubious tall, hairy creature that allegedly roams the forests, forests drink guys. (laughs) that roams the forested regions of many countries. Dyer has previous Bigfoot-related credibility problems. Here we go. Are you ready for this? I'm ready. According to KSAT.com, Dyer has finally released an image of the beast, of a beast he claimed to kill near San Antonio, Texas in September of 2012. The only prior evidence Dyer has ever released until now about this incident was a short grainy video that he claims shows a Bigfoot standing right outside of his tent near a wooded area on the outskirts of San Antonio. His website contains a haphazardly written account of the alleged Bigfoot encounter and subsequent quick killing of the animal. In fact, the date of the report is carelessly listed as September 6, 20... Oh wait, September 6, 20102. <laughs> What? Man, they're gonna. Why are they so picky? <laughs> he was nervous. He just killed a Bigfoot. Really? Instead it's, of 2012, uh, he put an extra zero in it. It's a freaking typo. Perhaps it's really about some distant future Bigfoot encounter. Demon Hunter. That, that could be. Yeah. In an interview February 23rd. I'm traveling with Bigfoot Hunter. Say, Bigfoot's got it, man. 2013 interview. Uh, Dyer said Bigfoot is 100% real. Demon Hunter. Shadow Nation. There's no question. Dyer said. I'm going to go down in history as the best Bigfoot tracker in the world. And reported, uh, the person that reported on that, of course, was San Antonio's KS 
ATTV. Thanks so much. All the best, Mr. Dyer. <laughs> we don't doubt you, brother. Keep well, the good it, fight. <laughs> wow. So let's step away from I'm Bigfoot a bit for here, Sean. And uh, I wanted to mention that uh, an ex Wisconsin medical examiner pleads guilty to taking body parts to train his dog. Really? I'll punch you in the mouth. That's right, a former Wisconsin medical examiner who took a piece of spinal column Ooh. that had been removed from a corpse to train his dog to be a cadaver dog pleaded guilty to felony charges on Friday, according to court documents. And this is, of course, from Reuters. So we've got to trust this, right? So now. he took a spinal column. Who are you calling a yep. psycho? Wow. From a corpse. Uh, Tracy England, 46, will be uh, sentenced February 10th on two felony counts of misconduct in a public office, <laughs> theft, and uh, he stole the spinal cord. Yeah, theft. Wow. Uh, what do you say? I'm sorry. <laughs> theft and charges against England were uh, dismissed as a part of a plea bargain in the uh, Foster County Circuit Court um, records show. Ooh. So I guess he he he's got he's plead to guilty to something um i so thought I it was a shovel felony um yeah felony count of uh misconduct versus theft huh? wow. um, Not a peppy. but um the criminal co <laughs> complaint said that england took a piece of bone from a corpse's spinal column after another medical examiner removed it during an autopsy on september 5th 2011 she told uh, fellow employees she planned to use the bone to train her dog. Um, the complaint mm. said, okay, well, I, I, I can see what she was thinking. I just don't think she was allowed to do this, right, Sean? It's, uh, investigators wrote that uh, the complaint against England uh, made comment on how lucky she had been to have gotten a piece of the spinal cord. Uh, so she actually admitted to doing it. Was it uh, from somebody famous? I wasn't listening to this I, story. I, you know what? I wasn't listening to me either. This was not, <laughs> this was not an interesting story. Uh, the person stole a piece of bone, okay? Yeah. And uh, she was wrong. She's going to pay for it. And now, uh, it's everybody's so touchy. Call. It's not like it was Decided. ripped out of a living person, you know? Well, I guess it was oh. at one time there. Though. Well, yeah. Yeah. Huh. This one comes from the Newser. The Newser? Newser. Read less, no more, Demon Hunter. Title, O'Neill, Dead Farrah Fawcett Talks to Me. You ready for that? Okay. Dead Farrah Fawcett Talks to who? O'Neill. O'Neill? Ryan O'Neill, to be exact. Isn't that her ex? Uh, I don't know. Let's read the story and find out. Let's find out more. Okay, let's go into this. It starts right now. Let's do <laughs> Out of Peppy. <laughs> no, I'm not. Ryan O'Neill appeared on the Today Show Demon Hunter Shadow Nation yesterday to chat about his legal coup regarding an Andy Warhol silkscreen of Fairy Fa Farrah Fawcett. It wasn't exactly a dry uh, legalese. Drink up, guys. Instead, O'Neill revealed that Fawcett granted him permission to appear on the show <laughs> that very morning because, you know, he talks to her. She said I could do it, he explained. I talked to her this morning. O'Neill said he was having minor skin cancer surgery when he learned that the case had ended in his favor. Not that the University of Texas, which Fawcett bequeathed all her art to, more on the case... Uh, later in the story, his son Patrick texted me. I was trying on an operating... Wait. I was laying on... <laughs> I was trying on an operating table. Drink! I was lying on an operating table. There was blood running down the side of my face, and then there were tears running down the side of my face, mixing with the blood. It was a pretty amazing moment for me. Really? Amazing. Out of Peppy! And the blood and the tears, you get that? I guess. It was a pretty amazing moment for me, he said. And he also went on to say that the school went after the painting in the first place because I have enemies. And one of them sent 90 emails to the re <laughs> regents. Okay. Okay. And they said he okay. stole the, the uh, paintings. Anyway, long story short, guys, this got boring real quick. <laughs> Ryan O'Neill... He came on today's show and said that uh, he could have the paintings back from the University of Texas that Farrah Fawcett bequeathed her private paintings to because she told him from beyond the grave. And there you go. That's the G&D show 
in the news. Yeah, because uh, we just, uh, I, I had one other one, Sean, and I looked at it, and uh, basically it was a report of a UFO, and it was a rugby sh- rugby ball-shaped UFO ball. near, <laughs> near uh, Hawthorne Airport in uh, London. Do you think maybe somebody's rugby ball just fell out of the airplane and say what? I don't know. Do you think a aircraft pilot would, if he mistake a rugby ball from the airplane, I think he's in trouble with the FAA. Demon Hunter. Oh, oh man, those were some those were some sad stories tonight. <laughs> you didn't like those? I. You know what? We've had better. Yeah, you've had better, Sean. I've, I've had. I better. guess I'm just too excited. I mean, when you compare those to what's going to go on later on tonight. Best part of our show is us. Well, that's true. That's what I like. Anyway, guys. Uh, the phone book. Yeah. Anderson. Anderson. Is that another story laid in? El Nighty. Bro, each week, guys, it's a and d original series that we uh, made up. That's why it's called G&D original series. Each week, we scour. Hold on. Let me start it. Oh, that's not it. Each week. <laughs> Uh, We'll get the bugs worked out here someday. Each week, Demon Hunter and myself scour the universe. Maybe not the universe, but the planet Earth to find you the greatest legends out there. From the bunny man to the lizard man to the moth man to the folk monster. We go down the back roads to bring you America's biggest legends. Demon Hunter, anything to add? That would be... uh, (laughs) Yeah, sure, why not? (laughs) This week... Our legend is brought straight from my hometown in New New Jersey, smack dab in the center of Sussex County. Mm -hmm. When we talk about, uh, well, he's got a couple different names. Some people might refer to him as Bigfoot. We (laughs) refer to him as Old (laughs) One-Eye. Red-Eye. Or Big Uh, (laughs) Red-Eye. The New Jersey Bigfoot. That's what we're bringing to you this week, folks. The New Jersey uh, Bigfoot. Hello. Yep. You should have, uh, there should be more stories tonight, I'm thinking, than Bigfoot. <laughs> There's like a Bigfoot in every county. How are we going to find all of them? Uh, you know, we're just going to have to look really hard. Well, the thing I, the reason I brought this one up, Sean, is like I said, I grew up where yeah. these stories take place. Yeah. And in fact, the main area where Big Red Eye or Old Red Eye has been sighted my best friend and I were actually chased by an animal when we were kids. What? Now, and you're, you're talking Sussex County, New Jersey. People think bears, but at the time we didn't have a bear problem like they have down there now. Yeah. And uh, it wasn't until after, years after we'd actually been chased by something in the woods there, that we discovered that the area we were in was known for a wow. Bigfoot. And like Bigfoot, Big Red Eye, this comes from uh, Weird, New Jersey. Uh, like Bigfoot, big red-eye sightings of the northwest corner of the state describe a large bipedal creature covered with long hair from head to toe. But what witnesses in Sussex County who have seen the beast for themselves remember most of all are the creature's glowing red eyes. Here are some uh, readers' accounts of their run-ins with uh, big red eyes. See, I've ne- I never sent my story in, Sean. But uh, over a period of two weeks, back in 1977, strange moaning and eerie, eerie, uh, eerie sounds, haunting screams, filled the night air of Wolffoot Road in Sussex County. And uh, newlyweds moved down the street. <laughs> it, the, the, the reason there's no longer any law enforcement down there, Sean, right. uh, it always started around 2 a.m. and went on until almost dawn. Well, maybe it was newlyweds. Uh, the wailing noise were constant. Uh, no, it wasn't newlyweds. No guy can last that long. And they lasted for hours. Speak See, for I told you. It sounded like someone kind of, some kind of huge primate making noise. Well, if you think it's a Bigfoot, what else are you going to think it is? See? And uh, it woke me up from a sound sleep. I had windows open so I could hear it really well, but couldn't tell what direction it was coming from. It's darn Sasquatch. Uh, yep. Other stories include... Uh, Old uh, Big Red Eye staring through the windows of their homes at 2.30 a.m. Yeah. Their red eyes peering through the glass. Um, 
Reports go on to the 1990s and even into the aughts, Sean, uh -huh. um, of a seven foot tall beast uh, in the back roads of Sussex County. We've got to go back down to my hometown, Sean. We've got to, apparently uh, Big Red Eye though hates condos. Really? Because you know- Yeah, I, I have learned that, uh, not that I'm a Big Red Eye uh, believer of urban legends or folklore, but I must tell you this story because the Big Red Eye in uh, the recent in issue gave me chills. This gentleman apparently um, had uh, an a encounter with Big Red Eye, but apparently does not like condo developments. Likes to uh, rip, uh, rip them <laughs> apart, Sean. <laughs> well, Bigfoot, I wonder why his eyes are glowing red, though. Do you think it's like I don't a... Know. Well, maybe, you know, that's what always made me wonder about this. Is it a Bigfoot? Is it something like the Mothman, maybe? Is it mm -hmm. like the... Well, they've got the Jersey Devil down there, too. Maybe it's a relative. Old Red Eye, guys. Tonight's Legend right. X series. You're welcome. And I've, I've, I've been chased by him. <laughs> you know, I know that they say... Every, everybody out there says, like with the uh, UFOs, they say it started out as, you know a weather balloon or, or or whatever and then it sprang from that now i would buy into it if there wasn't so many different credible witnesses now you can go to any convention on ghosts or aliens or whatever and you'll find freaks what they don't want to show you is the people like we've had on the show like stanton friedman uh uh astrophysicist brings you up the mathematical equations that tell you why it is more probable than not exactly right and blows us away every time. We just we just try to just go. Sit there huh? going, duh. <laughs> you know what, Stanton, you're right. <laughs> We're just gonna agree and nod. That that makes good radio. It we'll does. just nod a lot. It does. But uh, what I'm saying is, just like the Bigfoot, you know, because you you hear the, they seem always to be seven foot tall. The one thing that gets me though is the Bigfoot prints. You know mm -hmm. what I'm saying? Because you know how human feet they're all different. You have like i have a foot thing i can't stand feet so it's sometimes people have this foot thing i can't stand your feet either sean yeah well see some people have the um like fred flintstone toes Scotty, beat me up. yeah and some people have the curled over toes you know what i'm talking about that and then the i dated a chick one time that had her and i couldn't take it we had to break up because she had a huge big toe <laughs> and her other toes were little i just couldn't do it couldn't do it <laughs> real sweet lady you know, I wanted to stay around, but uh, could not do it. The toes just ch kicked you right out. Huh? I couldn't do it. Yeah. Start making it. You know, it was like, the Ooh. funny thing, Sean, is when I was growing up and this whole, before I even knew this legend existed, we were walking through the woods. Yeah. And all of a sudden, th sudden something big and brownish black stood up. And, you know, I grew up in the country. Like I said, we didn't have a bear problem at the time that this happened but you know we were taught how to avoid bears and what to do when we saw them and, you know we were taught not to run right. and to look at what uh, what was coming at you and this thing <laughs> literally just started chasing us and it was standing up so we ran you know it's a uh, bears don't chase you standing up right so so it, stu it, it stood up and said let's just <laughs> you just dropped in pants <laughs> You and didn't you, have your recording ready, did you? Uh, I didn't. I didn't. Yeah. You and Toby were never. I'm here for the gangbang. Seen again. That's why hey, Bigfoot stood up and told you. I'm here for the gangbang. <laughs> <laughs> that's how you got started, Sean. That's one funky monkey, <laughs> baby. <laughs> oh, good. <laughs> Thank you, Charlie. He's always got my back. So it's the new year. We've covered that. Now, what's going on in the new year? It's been pretty rocky. For me. I, l let me tell you a little bit. So, uh, last week, there was some trouble at work. I'm the union rep. Union strong, union proud. I, uh, I you know, I, I constantly have something going on with somebody, and, uh, and I'm trying to protect, protect, you know, whatever, their livelihood. So, just to make sure everything's kept fair. And uh, so, you know, I'm constantly busy with that, and uh, I do other things outside the radio program, radio show being the biggest, but I do other art forms, and... Um, that I'm always popping. So I'm driving to work. I'm coming in early. And I go to hit the interstate, 465, here in beautiful Indianapolis, Indiana. And the first thing I do, brand new tires all the way around, Demon Hunter, is I hear a boom, boom. Well, it's a six-foot deep pothole. Half yeah. my car, yeah, half my car goes into the pothole. So anyway, 
nothing's out of alignment, nothing. So I'm going to work and I get there and I go in and I'm working and everything. And I look out the window and this guy comes in. He says, hey, man, I don't know whose car that is, but the whole left side's flat. So I'm thinking, no way. I walk out there. The back one looks like somebody took a knife and stuck it all the way around, just ripped it out. And then the front one, the needle was coming out of the valve stem. So it was just going, so the cap on the valve stem was the only thing holding the air in. So I had to fix that. And, uh, just one thing after the next. So I'm hoping this 2014, supposed to be the year the Ghost Man and Demon Hunter picks it's up. It's supposed to be. We were we were given the prediction, Sean. We were given the prediction by uh, the Magic Man. Professor Magic. Slim King, last year he came on. He said that today. He said, do you guys remember when you predicted the Super Bowl win last year? That's right. He did. Was it last year or the year before? Uh, he was on last year, so he was talking about the... Well, he came on last year and predicted it, didn't he? We did. Remember he, he asked did. us... That's right. We we used our predictions. He he let us predict oh, it. Oh, good. And good. we did predict the uh, Super Bowl win using yeah. his system. We And we got the... Uh, yeah, we used uh, Professor Slim King's system, and we got the score to a T. Yep. I've never done anything like that in my life. We could have went to Vegas, man, and we wouldn't be sitting here right now. No, we'd be sitting uh, in comfier chairs right now doing the Ghost Man and Demon Hunter show. Yeah, that's true. Gold-plated chairs. Gold-plated with, uh, you know, rich, rich, uh, rich Corinthian leather. You know, I was thinking last week about the show when I was talking to Scott's uh, agent on the phone. We were talking and everything. And, and I thought about where we started with this show and how raw... Uh, we started. I was literally setting. Remember that? I, and listeners to the G and D show will know. I, I I was going through a divorce, and we st- I started out setting on a cardboard box with my laptop in my lap, with a little headset and uh, a mouthpiece. Remember that? Yep, I do. Everything we learned, we learned on our own, which some people probably say isn't enough, isn't that much, well, but it could be more. <laughs> Yeah, you know. But it's us. By us doing this on our own, our way, it's raw, Ghost Man and Demon Hunter. But what I was saying is, man, uh, you know, when we got those stats back this week uh, from all the listeners out there, you know, thank you guys from the bottom of our heart, because it does, like Demon Hunter was telling you, make all the difference when we find out that you guys are out there listening and supporting us. And, uh, you know, because we don't see your faces on this side. We just see each other's ugly mugs. So it's... uh, You know, and and we're working hard for you for bringing on these guests. Where else could you get this? You know, besides the... The Walking Dead or Talking Dead or something like that. <laughs> Talk to Scott. He was watching football. Multi-million dollar shows that uh, have a part. Yeah, he was watching hey, football game. We've got to find out what uh, which team he was rooting for. I don't know. Probably. Oh, I think the, uh, the Peyton Manning and the Broncos won tonight over your boys, Tom Brady and the Patriots. Well, I, I didn't really worry about that game. I was more interested in the Seahawks. Right. Well, that's going on, I think, now. Yeah. I think that's going on right now. Wait, you rooting for the Seahawks all of a sudden? I thought you was a Patriots fan. Well, I I, I support my local team. That doesn't mean I can't uh, you oh, know, appreciate the the root, rooting for the underdog, Sean. Bandwagon. Get lost. <laughs> Get bent. Get bent. Anyway, back to the screen here right now. So what's going on for your new year? I mean, what's been going on? Have you been having a bad one, or is it a good one? It, it started off a really weird year, Sean. Everything, you, like I said, everything just uh, kind of fell apart in 2014. It was like, yay, it's 2013. Oh, no, 2014. Oh, God. Oh, what's going to ha- happen next? What's, right. uh, you know, they kill off the Doctor Who, and now we've got to wait, uh, like, another 10 months for another episode. Right. Uh, Treme is off the air. If you can't tell, folks, my my life kind of rotates around TV these days because right. by the You're time old. I get home from either work or doing a case, release the house. By, by the time I get back here, I just want to watch an hour of TV and go to bed. Go to so. bed because you're old, and then usually we yeah. got to go down the in the uh, in the studio. And, uh, Liar! Yes, work real hard and get everything put together for Sunday's show. Yeah, so. well, it's. Uh, <laughs> It, it's tough. It's tough to get around and do it all. And like I said, everything that could go wrong has gone wrong since the start of 2014. We had two snowstorms yeah. in a row, knocked us off the air yep. both times. And um, we pushed forward. What's that? And we pushed forward. Press we, we did. We did. We pushed yeah. forward. And uh, now uh, just got to hope that uh, you know, having this big episode here tonight with Scott, is the start of like a wonderful brand new 2014. I've, I'm going to forget the last two weeks 
and start from now. Start fresh. We got to get Don Wildman back on. I was watching some mysteries at the museum last night, and uh, apparently he's a fan favorite with the ladies. Apparently, uh, I, I tell people that uh, we met up with him to do the show, and they're like, oh, "Don Wildman." Oh, yeah, and was it like six thousand downloads <laughs> or more now on Don's? I think he was eating a ham sandwich when we called. See, we always get the inside on folks. We'll just be anxious to see what Scott's doing tonight. He might be eating peanuts or something talking to us. So it's always... Oh, fun, fun, fun. Fun, fun, fun. Hey, you know, I was watching a thing the other night, and I was going to talk to you about it. I was watching a program on Freemason. Okay. The One World Order. Oh, (laughs) boo-hoo. And it was was talking about the uh, one eye on the pyramid and the symbols and all this and how everybody was together with Freemason. Now, I know you can't tell because I was in the Brotherhood or the Fraternal Eagles or whatever for a minute and I had the ceremony and everything. And I know that the Freemasons are very hush-hush and quiet. Yeah, yeah. We're the only secret society that tells you that we're a secret society. Right. Right. So what would you say to somebody like me that says... You're trying to dominate the entire world. What do you mean trying? <laughs> See, I don't have a ring. Even though we're brothers on the radio, <laughs> still, I'm not a Freemason, so I couldn't. I would say, Sean, anybody who asked, what are the Freemasons trying to take over the world? This is my answer to their question. Yeah. The day we can actually pull off a pancake breakfast and, and actually make some money doing it... <laughs> That night, we'll start planning to take over the world. But usually, we just can't even pull that off. So <laughs> Today, pancake breakfast. Tomorrow, world domination. <laughs> That's the way to set your goals high. Maybe we can take over the world. G&D on the rise. That's right. One world order. We're taking over radio one show at a time. That's a that's a fun fact right there. We own the internet. You know, I've been watching. I've been on a Netflix kick this week. I remember I texted you this week, and I've been st- yeah, I've been stuck on. You're gonna laugh about this. The Wonder Years. Really? Yeah. Do you remember that from '88 to '93? It was you the one. You texted me about it, and I, I had to be reminded about it. I really did because uh, that that was the one with uh, Fred Savage. Fred right? Savage. He was Kevin Arnold. Yeah, and he, he had the little girlfriend that he followed everywhere. Yeah, Winnie. And she was like real whiny. You know, she was like, she's like, I don't know what I mean. I, I like you, but I don't. And he was kind of whiny, too. He had an older brother, Wayne, picked on him a lot. But uh, yeah, we, we all recognize that character, Sean. It's, uh, that's well, yeah. you, right? What, the older brother? Yeah. Well, yeah. <laughs> Butthead, that's what he called him all the time. It was a good show, though. I mean, I really like props to Netflix because they really put on these great shows uh, for us to watch. Sometimes there's nothing on there. There's turds. But... Uh, for the most part, there's good shows. But yeah, I got stuck on the Wonder Years, man. And I was, I, I posted, I said, you know, I'm sitting here tonight watching the Wonder Years on Netflix thinking, last time I seen this, I was 13, sitting on my waterbed. Huh? Yeah. <laughs> staring at my, uh, staring at the TV watching, thinking I didn't want to go to school tomorrow. Now I'm sitting in my recliner at 38 watching the Wonder Years, thinking I don't want to go to work tomorrow. <laughs> Not much has changed. Nothing has changed, actually, Sean. You still tell the same jokes. Oh! Liar! That's bad. Anyway, guys, tonight's BAM, we're going to get ready to go to break here. Because we want to give uh, Demon Hunter a little extra time to bring in our guests. What do you think about that, Demon Hunter? I would appreciate that. It'd feel good. It'd feel right. It would get everything going. Yeah. And once again, guys, I wanted to... What'd you say? We'll be able to do a phone test with them. It's, uh... And once again, I wanted to remind you guys, three-day race for the cure, guys. Season G. Holman, Coleman, three-day race for the cure. Find out more about that at our website, ghostanddemon.com. Support Sandy Merritt and Elizabeth Knoll, guys. Find, uh, join the fight to battle cancer today. Go to our website. Donate some money. The link's up there. Click on it. Go to donate. Tonight's band, Demon Hunter. Dun, dun, dun. Burning Bridget Cleary. Find out more about them at burningbridgetcleary.com, guys. And tonight's song, Know Who Is Sick. I know who is sick. And uh, with that, Demon Hunter, we'll be right back. <laughs> Shoes of fine green leather, and 
Enjoy yourselves. <laughs> oh my god. That's right. Welcome back, Shadow Nation, to the one, the only. Mystifying Oracle Radio, your Ghost Man and Demon Hunter show. I'm not going to argue with that, Sean. <laughs> I almost messed up the uh, intro coming back in, guys. <laughs> Tonight's guest, Demon Hunter, Shadow Nation. Since the 1960s, he's brought drama and suspense to both your television set and the silver screen. With such works on The Great Gatsby and In the Heat of the Night, and most recently known for his work on the AMC classic hit series, the Walking Dead. Help us welcome Mr. Scott Wilson to studio. Scott, what's going on, man? You, you're what's happening. <laughs> <laughs> hey, uh, I called uh, Dana earlier, and she said, uh, I said, are you going to call Scott and make sure everything's going? She said, no, because he's probably watching football. <laughs> All right. Well, I was. Yeah, yeah. Peyton Manning, huh? Good. Oh, he had a great game, didn't he? Yeah, he did. I'm an Indianapolis kid, born and raised, so uh, when he it uh-huh. killed us, killed us when he went you to Denver. Know it. <laughs> and you know him. He did a great job. But, yes, getting close to the Super Bowl. Yes, it you're, is. You're a big football fan, Scott? Well, big enough. <laughs> <laughs> but it, it's all fun. It's all good. Now, I've been doing my research on you, Scott. Actually, for years, uh, ever since The Exorcist Three, stuff like that from the 80s and, and on and on. But uh, you've done so much, and we're going to cover that tonight. But I wanted to start out, I was thinking all week, what questions to ask Scott, because I want him to remember this show. And uh, I just can't get around some of the basics, because our listeners, don't they need to know about when you started out. It's such an amazing story. I mean, basketball scholarships and, and uh, uh Scholarship for architecture, um, all that stuff. Can you can you tell us how it all started as a man from Georgia, a young boy starting out? Well, my 
father was a building contractor. He, he was a mason before, and he was kind of teaching me the trade uh, the way he learned it from his father. And uh, then I was on an athletic, playing basketball at uh, Southern Tech, That's it. and which was a, at the time two-year branch of uh, Georgia Tech. Right. I got hepatitis, ended up, he died when I was 13, my father, and uh, I was in the Georgia Tech infirmary. They said I couldn't play basketball anymore, and I got to thinking about it, and, and I hitchhiked to California when I was healthy, and then uh, ended up in an acting class and stayed with it. <laughs> Five and a half years later, after doing a lot of plays and workshops and I uh, got my first film interview, which was for In the Heat of the Night. Right. And that that film was with Sidney Poitier, Rod Steiger, uh, Norman Jewish, and directed it. And it won, I think, four, maybe more Academy Awards. I know it was nom- nominated for more. And that led to uh, In Cold Blood with Richard Brooks, and on, based on Truman Capote's novel. Right. Classic. And, then I've, I've been uh, up and down the the uh, elevator ever since. <laughs> <laughs> well, I gotta say, when I when I told my friends that uh, who are all movie aficionados, uh, not not myself, I, I don't know half of what they know. But I said, you know, we've uh, we've got. I started talking about The Walking Dead and how you were coming on tonight, and they said, well, well, who is it you're having come on? And I said, well, it, it's Scott Wilson. And they, they all t- turned to me and said, in cold blood, Scott Wilson? <laughs> so that was like, that jumps yeah. out as such a, uh, you know, such a classic movie with such such effect on everybody who's a movie fan. Yeah, it, it's, uh, it holds up. I had the occasion to see it recently on the big screen, and it, was, it, it definitely holds up. It's a well-directed film, well-written film. It's, uh, I've been fortunate. Now, you know, when I left Georgia, I really wanted to see some of the world, and that's the reason I left. I hitchhiked out. I was 19 and left Georgia at $40, and, and uh, I've accomplished it. I've seen quite a bit of the world, and the good thing is I, I have seen the world while I was working So, you know, as an actor, so I got to see it from... And a lot of indigenous films from different countries, like in Poland, Yugoslavia, oh yeah, Hungary, uh, Spain, uh, Israel, Japan, South Korea, Germany. I, so I've, I've been very, you know, I've had a fun run. And hopefully, it will keep going for a while. Hey, Big Scott, what was it like when you? I mean, because that takes big ones to just be in Georgia all your life. You're at home with mom. You're, uh, what kind of work were you doing at the time? When, and, and what did you see that said, you know what? I'm done with this. I'm heading to L.A., baby, and I'm going to make it work. Well, I, again, I, I was ill. I had hepatitis, uh, and I was in isolation in the in Georgia Tech Infirmary. And then then uh, they said I couldn't play ball anymore. If you have a relapse, it's fatal. And, then, you know, that works on your head. Yeah. So I decided I wanted to see some of the world and I got very fortunate I ended up in the right acting class and the instructors there kind of inspired me and and uh, made me uh, you know made me want to continue acting and I think I was very lucky that, that it worked out the way it did because it's been a lot of fun Right. I think I heard in a previous interview you had a couple more drinks than you should have, and you ended up stumbling into a <laughs> acting class. And uh, yeah, I'm going to leave that out. <laughs> <laughs> Sorry, oh, Scott. You can't leave that out on this. I've done my no. homework. I did my homework. <laughs> what happened? There was uh, a roommate. I got my first job, and I went in with a couple of other guys, and we rented this small house, and and. Uh, one of the guys was 33 at the time. I thought he was an old man, but but because uh, I was like 19, and <laughs> and I was really too integrated to to uh, 
go into the class. So he physically carried me and sat me down on the sofa and went up, banged on the counter, said, who's in charge? I've got a movie star for you. So. <laughs> So at the end of the class, the teacher said, I don't know what your problem is. Don't come back to my class drunk. So I went back the next week and apologized to him. And uh, he gave me a monologue to do from a Eugene O'Neill one-act play called The Long Voyage Home. And I, for some reason, went back the next week and did it and realized that, that I had found what I wanted to do. So it was quite, quite fortuitous in a way. Now, I, I don't want to be jumping ahead here, but, but like starting off with the In, in Cold Blood, um, well, In the Heat of the Night and then In Cold Blood, but you had such a reputation for being the bad guy. And yeah. now you're like the loving father fi figure that America looks up to, the moral guidance. You know, how, how, has, how has that like spanned, you know, that's spread across all those years, but it must affect, you know, the way you go you go into parts now and think, you know, this is how I'm going to do this. I have this whole, you know, this whole repertoire that I can do. Yeah. Well, I mean, certainly in the early days, the, it kind of put me in a corner uh, the, in cold blood. And, and even in the heat of the night, to a degree, even though he wasn't a guilty party in, in, in the heat of the night, uh, he was accused of uh, killing someone, but he didn't. Uh, and he was a more sympathetic character. But In Cold Blood did put me in a corner. And I did a Robert Aldrich film called The Grissom Gang uh, because I said, okay, this is a different kind of a killer. <laughs> I'll show that I can act. <laughs> because, and and it, was, it was fun working with uh, Robert Aldrich. He was a wonderful director. I've been very fortunate with the directors that I've worked with right, right from the beginning. And up through The Walking Dead, I mean, some wonderful directors directing that show. Oh, yeah. Yeah. So. Well, I know I've seen you in X Files and, and CSI and all these. And it just, I know it's not easy. I know you got to prepare, but you just make it seem so easy. And then I was watching Exorcist 3 with the kids, <laughs> the kids last night before they went to sleep because they wanted <laughs> to see it. And of course, they ran to bed. They didn't want to see the, you know, when it got real bad. But uh, you made me nervous when. <laughs> When you smoke in those cigarettes, one after the one. How do you prepare for these different roles, you know, mentally? Well, you're, one, you, you know, it was, it was, it was, a little training goes into it. And a lot of imagination. And, and uh, I always suggest to young actors that they listen to themselves and follow their imagination. It, it's uh, quite often when you first read something, you see it more clearly than you do in subsequent readings. But try to get back to that first reading if you can. And I know when I read that, I in Luke uh, Temple, Doctor Temple was uh, possessed by the devil in that show. Mm. And I said, "Let's make him nervous." Uh, <laughs> so Why I, did you? I, actually suggested to Bill Blatty, who I worked with in a film called The Ninth Configuration. Uh, that is, that's a bit of a cult film. Oh, yeah. But, but uh, I suggested to him that we make him a chain smoker. And it would do several things. One, it would show his, how fidgety he was. And two, it would make smoking look bad. <laughs> <laughs> Yeah, it was killing me. You had stacks of magazines. You said, I, they got good articles. I just <laughs> haven't got to them. And you had that ashtray <laughs> just flowing over with smokes. and <laughs> I, I got nervous. Off. I mean, you just brought it home. Uh, you're good friends with William Peter Blatty, right? I am. I haven't seen him in a long time. He lives back in, in uh, the Washington area or Virginia, you know, back in that area. Yeah. And of course, I've talked to him, but I haven't seen him in a while. The Exorcist and everything like that. Dealing with the dark films, um, is there anything? Because you always seem to be portrayed, like Demon Hunter said, in the dark genre. You know, like uh, yeah. Well, I did a film a few years ago based on a play that uh, Pope John Paul II wrote. Uh, when he was a young man, he was an actor and a playwright, and. He, Carol Voitiwa before he, he uh, became uh, John Paul. But but uh, 
I play a saint in that. It's probably the only time in history that a playwright has canonized his protagonist and because he did uh, sanctify uh, uh, Adam Mulowski, who was a successful artist, and he lived from 1845 to 1917. And in his 40s, he came in contact with the homeless and the poor, and it had a profound impact on him. He gave up the world of art, became a monk, and devoted the balance of his life uh, to helping the poor. And actually, Mother Teresa's sisters studied with the Albertine sisters before they went to India. Wow. But, but uh, So we had two audiences with uh, Pope John Paul II, which was, was uh, <laughs> oh my. Quite, a, quite an experience. So I played good guys, too. <laughs> <laughs> oh, yeah. Hey, Scott. Well, I'm sorry, Nate. Go ahead. I, I was just thinking, I, I, this just popped into my head. I... I realized this week when i was going over your bio and everything uh, a while back i had watched a movie with uh, leonardo dicaprio called shutter island and i was sitting there thinking to myself i know i've seen this story before and it wasn't until i was going through your bio and i saw castle keep oh yeah that i realized oh i have seen this story before you know it's uh yeah. that that yeah. that constant re regrowing of uh a reusing of the you know good classic stories and you see them happening right. again. i mean again Great Gatsby just came out again last year. It's, yeah, it uh, did. It did. But the, the Castle Keep was Burt Lancaster, and we you know what a hell of an actor he was. Oh, yeah. Uh, and Sidney Pollack directed that. Uh, it was one of his early films, second, maybe second or third at most, but, but uh, what a great body of work he ended up with. And. You know, so it, it 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 was. It's been, you know, John Frankenheimer. Uh, <laughs> there are a lot of fantastic directors. Krzysztof Zanussi, who's a Polish director, I did a film with in 1984 during martial law in Poland, and it was the first, I guess, American Polish co-production, and and. Uh, with with uh, some German producer as well, Regina Ziegler, and we, Christoph and I talked about making a film for about nine years before we finally got it made, and we entered it in the Venice Film Festival and won the Golden Lion at Venice Film Festival. So that was quite a interesting experience. It was a lot of fun. Oh wow. And I think if I think a nice film too. Hey Scott, I wanted to ask you because we had uh, one of your uh, co-hosts on from The Walking Dead. We had Michael Rooker, Big Mikey, on. Uh, eh, it's been a couple yeah. months back, and he was telling us, you know, the jobs he worked in between when he was building up his career. And of course, Henry Portrait of a Serial Killer was his big break. But uh, he said he cleaned trailers for the stars. He did odds and ends when he was working. What kind of jobs did you have? Because I knew it just didn't happen right away. No. It, it, uh... <laughs> Well, I first job that I did was uh, knocking on doors and selling periodicals. We didn't call them magazines. <laughs> <laughs> they were periodicals. Uh, so I did that. I worked at the Superior Oil Company as a mail clerk. Uh, that was a very large company, an uh, oil company. Uh, and they offered actually to to uh, pay my way through school, uh, USC or UCLA, wherever I wanted to go, if I would stay with them for X number of years after I graduated. And I told them that I was actually uh, going to school. I'd been going to acting classes at night. But I they said, oh, great. What kind of, what, what are you studying? I said, acting. And a few months later, <laughs> they fired me. <laughs> but, but they were very nice. It was, that was fun. And then I worked as a mail clerk, at, uh, a shipping clerk at uh, Bailey Films. That's an educational films house that rents films to schools and colleges and civic groups. And uh, that was, and ended up splicing film there, not editing, but splicing films when it broke. When they broke. Uh, so I, then, then working in gas stations and working in grocery stores as box boy and cashier and working in uh, parking cars and, and 
you know, whatever, whatever I could do to find a way to pay for acting classes. Got real familiar with ramen noodles, huh? That's kind of how I did it through <laughs> college. <laughs> it, it, it's funny, too, because I have a lot of young kids that work for me who, uh, you know, they're, most of them are film students or acting students, things like that. And I remember them talking to me one day and saying, you've had so many jobs, Nathan. Why, why how, you know, we, it's hard to believe you've done so many things. And I've explained to them that when you're following your dream, you go out and do whatever it takes to pay to follow the dream. <laughs> Which yeah, means, and it doesn't really work either. Yeah, it's. I mean, it, it, it's uh, you're in pursuit of something, and I didn't dwell on the jobs. Well, I, I have to say, when I hit about 21, somewhere around there, I said, "What am I doing with my life? You know, am I going to?" I was making minimum wage that was about dollar sixty-five an hour. And I'm saying, I'm, what am I doing here? And I had worked as a junior draftsman in Atlanta before I came out here. And I brought some of my samples of my work with me when I came out here and, and uh, to California. And, and uh, I looked around for a job. I was offered a job for with uh, Western Geographical drafting underground oil deposits. Wow. And... You know, they said you can go as high as you want to go. It's up to you. And I was, you'd be traveling the world, drafting an underground oil deposit. And I, I, uh, I said, well, it's either pumping gas or drafting. I guess I'll pump gas and take my chances. So <laughs> that was kind of the second, you know, the, the second time I had to make a choice. Yeah. Uh, and it was, it was, uh, so I kept pumping gas and and enjoying doing the classes and doing plays that I was, you know, and, and building sets and doing the lighting and putting in the chairs. And it was it was intensive, I'd say, for five years. Every day I was doing something related to acting. Right. Acting itself. So, Scott, get into The Walking Dead, the AMC's. <laughs> You know, hit can, series. Can I throw one his, like bit of history back before we go into the Walking Dead show? Because I, I, once I go, we go, go forward. Ahead. I don't want to go back. You go ahead. I wanted to ask uh, you, Scott. Um, in the heat of the night, huge mm. influence on my life. I grew up in a small town in New Jersey, and right next door we had a town called Sparta, and there was a mm -hmm. chief called Gillespie, and <laughs> you know that that uh, that that. Um, that area of New Jersey, that northwestern corner, is so backwoods back in the 60s and 70s, and there was a lot of racial tension there that everybody assumed that the book had been written about that town. Oh, wow. And, I can understand that. Yeah. There's a lot of coincidences. Yeah, there. so it was just you one know, of those... I'm working with, by the way, working with uh, Sidney Portier and Rod Steiger in your mm. first film, was a little, <laughs> you know, odd. You, you know, you're awed by it. You, you're working with legends, who they were legends at the time, <laughs> and it, it was just uh, just a great way to start because they they were so supportive, and, and so was Norman Jewison, and they were just so totally supportive of me and what I was trying to do as an actor and and helpful, and actually uh, Sidney Poitier and and had called Richard Brooks, who directed in Cold Blood, and told him that he should see me. And I wasn't aware of that until the last day of shooting on the heat of the night. And Quincy Jones also called him. That was Quincy's first uh, two films that he did the score on, was, was uh, in Cold Blood and in the heat of the night. And, and uh, Norman was allowing him to look at the dailies, which I didn't know anything about. <laughs> And it was just, uh, they couldn't have been nicer to me. And I've never forgotten that. And I, I try to pass a little of that on when I have the opportunity to with, uh, with young actors that I'm working with. I try to be generous with them. Oh, wow. Uh, it, it's, uh, so I wish I was know. still a young actor. Yeah. yeah and, and, and Rod got, I've done, I think, three three different films with, with uh, Rod Steiger, who won the Academy Award for that for Best Actor. Wow. Well, it was such a, you know, it was only a few years after Steinbeck had written, uh, written Travels with Charlie and had talked mm -hmm. so much about the separatism of, in, of the whites and the blacks in the South. He almost apologized for writing that part of the book. Mm -hmm. And, you know, and then 
you know, in the heat of the night comes out, and that's just throwing it in the face of uh, the population. During the time that this came out, did you encounter any, like, uh, anybody, f- like, arguing with you for being in this movie at the time? I you never know? did, no. I, I, uh, I have to say that I never did. And I know that I was hoping at the time that the, the film would, uh, by this time, would become so in the past that you'd be saying, what are they talking about? <laughs> <laughs> it's the, you know, the racial tensions that were in the film. But, the, but the, it's a good murder mystery as well. Yeah. I mean, the, it, uh, as well as dealing with the social issues that were very relevant at the time and are still relevant, but, but not as much so as they were then. That was an amazing movie. But get into The Walking Dead, your last project that you were working on. Uh, did you did you think I know you were reading the script before and your mother was there and she said it was really good. What did you feel when you first read that thing? Were were you ready to go? Well, after I saw the first of all, when you hear Frank Darabont and you hear Gail Ann Hurd's names mentioned, right? Uh, you your ears perk up. You <laughs> want to hear more about it. And I hadn't seen the shows prior to that, but after the there was some interest in me doing three or four episodes or two or three, I forget what it was at the time, but I made it a point to look at the first season, the first six shows that they had the first season, and I loved what I saw. Yeah. I thought the the, uh, the zombies were just so well done, and that's <laughs> Greg McCarroll's work and his team, and it gave because they were so well done, it gave the actors a lot of room to work. And it allowed the actors to become, uh, you know, this band of survivors that were in this apocalyptic world. And I, I said, that's great. And it's going to open the door for a lot of a lot of opportunities down the road. And I'd like to work with these kids or these young actors. They're not kids. <laughs> uh, these young actors, because I... I was excited by what they were doing. But a lot of them did say, Scott, that they looked up to you as a father on the set. Matter of fact, when you were on The Talking Dead, you said, it's exactly like being on... I mean, heck, the whole stage was crying when you got... <laughs> I mean, my wife was tearing up, for God's sakes. I was <laughs> I was like, no, not Herschel. So, you know, it's such an emotional... You had such an emotional, like Nathan was saying, uh, kick your butt if you don't do what I'm trying to tell you to do. I'm teaching you father figure on the show. It broke so many hearts. Was it like a family on the show? And if it was, what was it like when the cameras, you know, were off? Did it continue? Well, yeah, there, there was, uh, there was, and still is, uh, uh, social intercourse with the, the the cast members. You know, some of us play golf, or we meet, and we have dinner, we go shoot pool. Or we, you know, there's there's the other night there was a dinner here that several of us were at. Yeah, that that's a pool hall I want to walk into, Sean, and yeah. just see the cast of The Walking Dead shooting pool. We'll walk up to Scott and say, hey, we did a TV show. <laughs> will, will you take us and throw us on a couch <laughs> and tell us that uh, we're up for it? You know, we've had some film time, Scott, with reality TV, and we, we got to feel uh, Demon Hunter more so than me, but uh, we got to host our own television show. And, of course, it, it didn't go for the full season, got canceled, but uh, I was going to ask you, what's it feel like being such a great actor? All the because we know how all the lights are on you, the camera, you're dealing with the elements, all these other actors standing around you, and you have to deliver this scene. What's that feel like? Have you ever messed up and and it just kind of shatter you for a minute? And you have to. How do you motivate yourself to get back in it when you when you mess up? Very rarely do you do one take. (laughs) 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 So so you have you have multiple opportunities, and you. You're working with actors who are very prepared. They're very professional and, and talented people that you're working with. So, you know, uh, it, it's easy to work with people that are talented. It, it, it's fun. You, and, you know, you, you're, sometimes you're, your best work is off camera when you're, you're trying to, to help the actor that's on camera so it you know it, it, and everyone on that show is like that so it, it's really you know i think that tone is set by andrew and 
uh, of course, Norman and, and all the other wonderful actors uh, that, that I was fortunate enough to work with on it. I really loved working on the show. It was a lot of fun. And it's the first time that it's the longest amount of time that I've worked on a char- with a character, a uh, same character, Herschel, over, in essence, three seasons. Right. And it's really quite interesting. You Mostly, I've done a few guest shots on television, but but mostly I've done film, and you have like a two-hour script somewhere in that neighborhood. So you have your beginning, middle, and end, and you can arc it out, and you, you, you once you've done it, it's over. But in this, you see a script, and you say, okay, this is a line that may be foretelling something that's going to happen in the future so it, it's uh you pay attention to to uh to the lines you pay attention to where it might be going and you try to uh try to plant the seeds <laughs> hey, the, it, when the, it does come up it, it will resonate if, if not consciously subconsciously with the audience that right been, you know been following the show so it's it's totally, uh, I was totally excited. To, it was exciting to, to play the role. Now, I, I do have a question from the chat room. Uh, somebody wanted to ask, the veterinary community was very excited to have a vet on the show. Uh, how, did, uh, the, how did the writers and you prepare for the skill sets that would be needed to uh, bring that to the group? Well, it, it was interesting. A friend of mine that I grew up with went to veterinary school and I called him, talked to him a little bit about it. And, and uh, you know, these veterinarians are well-trained and, and you know, it was, I loved the line with, uh, that I had with Sarah Wayne Callies and I think it was the first episode that I was in where she says, uh, she says, so you're a doctor? And he says, I'm a vet. She says, you're a veteran of the war, you know, <laughs> and then says, "No, I'm a veterinarian." <laughs> she says, "Well, you're in way over your head, aren't you?" <laughs> and I think Herschel's response was, uh, "Aren't we all?" Yeah, but, but uh, you know, it, it's it's uh, it's catch as catch can in that world. In the world of the in any apocalyptic situation, it's catch as catch can. Well, Transcat wanted to get that question out there. I I do have one that I have been dying to ask you. Um, did you know that that smile you gave at the end <laughs> of the last episode was going to pull the heartstrings of America? Yeah. Because every guy who watched that show just went I. I bet my dad would have smiled at me like that. I think everybody I felt so proud. Everybody called their dad Scott after that scene. <laughs> <laughs> well, it was it was uh, I, you know, I I I don't give the writers credit to uh, the writers suggested that there's a smile there, and I immediately saw the wisdom of it and the director, Ernest Dickerson, was there and you know, he he reminded me that it was time to do the smile. <laughs> uh, and Ernest was the one that introduced me to the show. He directed the first episode I was in and then he chopped my leg off and yeah. started season three and then he took my head off. <laughs> <laughs> You know you're a good actor when you can lose body parts and they still want you around. You know what I mean? Uh, I, I just gotta, I just gotta say, my my father passed away years ago, and I, on the last night that I spent with him holding his hand, he gave me that smile, and I watched you on TV and went, yeah. "That was the smile my dad gave just before," and yeah. it's always stuck with me. And I watched you do it, and I cried. I cried when I saw the smile, and uh, what a wonderful. Well, yeah, that it, it's never easy to lose a parent. I, my father died when I was 13, yeah. uh, and but then I lost a lot of uh, uncles and who died from that point forward. Actually, one of them died before my father did, and I've seen that smile too uh, from from uncles who became like father figures to me. So it, it's uh, I understand what you're saying. It, it's 
there's a there's a, a beauty to it. There's a sweetness to it. Yeah. There's a acceptance of you to it. Yeah. Well, Scott, I tell you what, man, it has been an honor, and we could talk to you for hours on end because you can teach us so much, and you have teached so much over the years in your your acting career, and you've accomplished so many things. Um, do you have any? Is there anything that uh, anybody should know? Is there any place that people could get a hold of you, send you an email, or a thank you? Anything? Well, you know, there's I don't know. I, <laughs> there's a there's a face, but I don't do any of the really really do any of the social media. I, I should because I realize that it's uh, important part of today's world. But but uh, there's a Facebook page that someone sent me a, a, a entry to. Uh, it's called Tribute to Herschel Green, T R W E N E, and the fans have. A lot of fans have found that page, and they keep contributing to uh, contributing to it, and it keeps growing. I mean, this. Oh yeah. Really, it really makes me feel good that that I have connected with the with the uh, with the public and the fans of the of the show that as as much as I have. It's going to be hard mid season coming back up in two weeks to come back without Herschel Green. I mean, it's it's going to be a it's going to be a big thing. I'm sure they're going to do it, but. People feel your loss, Scott, on the show. It is? Do you think Rick's gonna like portray the new Herschel sensation? Like, did that smile encourage him to go forth and be the Herschel of the group? Well, you know, now I get to sit back and watch the show <laughs> as a fan would watch it, and I wonder the same things. And and but he's so focused on what he's doing, and he he brings such energy to the to the set and. You know, as I, it's contagious. Every <laughs> member on the set is very, very focused. And I, you know, I think like episode, I think eight was really set up for Herschel by by uh, four oh three. What was the name of that uh, episode? It's where he before he goes into the prison, he gives us if you step outside, you yeah. risk your life. And, oh yeah, you know all of that. That set it up, and that was the first really proactive, proactive stuff that Herschel had done in some time. Uh, usually, he was more reactive to what was going on around him, which is good. It's good either way. It's good stuff to play either way. But he was more proactive there, and then then in four oh five internment uh, was another very proactive scene. Mm-hmm. Yep for Herschel is probably the best episode that Herschel has had there. Uh, Chandler Powell wrote that episode, and David Boyd was the director of it. Powerful, man. I love how you refer to Herschel like he's a separate person when he's on the set. (laughs) That's it. Well, it kind of is, you know. (laughs) Yeah. No, I understand completely, but normally, you know, so often we hear people saying, you know, when I did this, when I, and, you know, that that is the separate person when you're there, and it's uh, yeah, yeah. I'm, I, it's it's um, however someone refers to, to the character they're playing, or however they refer to it, that's their personal thing preference. But I think I've always made it kind of third person when I'm talking about what I'm doing. It's uh, it kind of allows me to step back a little bit to. To evaluate what I'm doing for me personally. Quick, quick question about B4TM. It's been announced. A character of Eugene. Is this uh, something? Oh yeah, 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 yeah. That, I was in a little film a few years ago called Behind the Mask. Mm-hmm. That was. It's a nice little film. It was a spoof in a way on on the horror genre, and they're talking about doing a, a sequel to it. Mm. So, I played this kind of role model for these. <laughs> 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 it, it's really a, it was really a wonderful little film. <laughs> uh, very witty, very clever, and uh, about all the things that that are kind of the staples of that genre, uh, like the bad guy is chasing you and. He's just walking, and he keeps gaining on you while you're running. <laughs> <laughs> That's like the unlimited shotgun ammo. Uh, 
right. Remember that, Scott? Do you still have that shotgun? <laughs> I wish I did. I was, I was to find that episode. You know, I, I gotta I say, what I do have, I do have uh, my head in a trash bag in the closet. Oh my gosh! <laughs> You're just like the governor now. <laughs> you know what? I always wanted Demon Hunter. I wanted Scott if he stays after a minute after the show and does the uh, Ghost Man Demon Hunter show thing for us. Um, for him to say one of the most powerful lines, come back here. <laughs> you once said this isn't a democracy. That, that, and then go, you listen to the Ghost Man Demon Hunter show. Come back here and listen. <laughs> I know you want to. It, it was fun. But again, like Lori Holt, <laughs> another wonderful actress. Dale Jeffrey DeMunn, what a terrific actor he was to work with. John Bernthal, you know, Stephen Yeun. Uh, yeah. All these, all these wonderful Lauren Cohen, Emily. Uh, uh, Carol, uh, Emily, Carol, uh, Melissa McBride, mm-hmm. and, uh, my both, you know, both my daughters were just fantastic, and the new people that, are, that have come on since I was there, I call them new, but they've been there a couple of seasons now. And the governor was fantastic, so <laughs> so interesting. Melissa. It's a fun show. It's a fun show for all the actors, and and everyone really works hard, you know. They work, and the crew works incredibly hard. They're, they're very, I mean, you're shooting in eight days. Most episodes are eight days. Maybe you get nine. But you're shooting action stuff that on a movie would take you at least two weeks to shoot. They're doing it in a day or half a day. Right. It's really, really amazing. Did you have any, like, uh, were you a little bit more prepared for the Georgia heat having been grown up there? Uh, I don't think you're ever prepared for that, <laughs> even if you live there year-round. <laughs> I mean, it gets very hot and humid and a lot of insects. And oh, yeah. A lot well, of things. Scott, we've kept you over 10 minutes, sir. Could you stay on the line while we close out the show? Sure. We appreciate that. And, Sean, Wow. <laughs> yeah. Hey, man, Scott Wilson. That's one of, in eight years of doing this, actor Scott Wilson, one of my favorite shows we've done. Probably. Great. Yeah. Yeah, I got to agree. Great. <laughs> Scott, stay on one minute, brother. Okay. Thank you. Demon Hunter, we got to do this. Oh, no, I don't want to. That's it, guys. Hey, make sure to find us now at Stitcher Smart Radio. You can pick us up there. You can pick us up at Planet Paranormal as well. Special thanks to Creations by Souls Denounce at soulsdenounce.com. Midnight Syndicate, thanks for the tunes. Be sure to check out our website, guys, for the Susan G. Komen three-day race for the cure. Make sure you get in there and battle cancer, guys. Go today. It's a serious thing, okay? Special thanks to uh, Burning Bridget Cleary. Find out more about them or tonight's band at burningbridgetcleary.com. Hey, from the haunted back roads of America, this has been another exclusive G&D interview. Don't go change in America. You know we won't demon hunter. Because we love you. Night, guys. Night, guys.